we're going to get started. We're talking about the in the second section, the second lesson of gospel clarity for this week. Hey, Nick, welcome. And um, I'm excited about it, but there's more material than we'll probably be able to get through. Oh, yeah, there's um, some materials over here. Uh, if you want to grab some. Wait, I can grab one for you. No, no. So why don't we get started, uh, Dennis, would you be op- willing to open our time in prayer? So one of the things that we talk about with understanding the gospel and, and having greater clarity of the gospel is that it, the gospel is about who God is and it's about who man is. And that's what we're going to try to cover today. I've got a short section on who man is because we'll go further into that in the next lesson where we talk about our fallen, our fallen nature or the fallen circumstance that we are in and where that puts us before God. So we won't get into sin this week uh, in our teaching, but um, we'll talk about a few other things. When we discuss the attributes of God or who God is, what, why do you think it would be important to talk about who God is when sharing with somebody or just for our own knowledge, having an accurate knowledge of who God is? Yeah, Kelly? Well, because many non-Christians think God is Okay, so uh, knowledge of who God is could be not influenced by who God's revealed himself to be, but some other input or failed logic or some other reason. So, good. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, wait. For a number of reasons, they may be ignorant of God in the first place. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We find that. Examples of that in Scripture... Um, which we'll go to here in a little bit, but just ignorant of God, either his existence or ignorant of his nature overall. Anything else stand out to you as why this is important, who God is? I think the gospel wouldn't make sense without our understanding of who God is. It's kind of a base for beginning. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we're going to talk about some of his attributes. Obviously, we won't exhaust it. It is... The highest and most lofty speculation and study that man can do are thoughts of God. Um, Charles Spurgeon introduces one of his sermons with this beautiful introduction. You'll find it at the beginning of the Knowing God book by J.I. Packer in the first chapter. Uh, this introduction to his sermon is there's, there's nothing greater that we can have than the thoughts of who is God and what is he like. So this first paragraph says, what are God's attributes? When we talk about attributes of God, we're trying to answer questions like, who is God? What is God like? What kind of God is he? An attribute of God is something true about him. Well, fully comprehending who God is is impossible for us as limited beings. God does make himself known in a variety of ways. And through what he reveals about himself in his word and in his creation, we can begin to wrap our minds around our awesome creator and God. So God is unlike anything or anyone we could ever know or imagine. He is one of a kind, unique, without comparison. Even describing him with mere words truly falls short of capturing who he is. Our words simply cannot do justice to describing our holy God. Still, God possesses attributes that we can know, even just in part. <clears throat> and his, he's given us his word as a means to understand himself. So I had a friend who 
um, a, a close friend of mine who was a Christian when I was in high school, and I became very close. I'm still close to him to this day. And then his father is uh, who primarily was reached with the gospel in their family. And his father told me the story of a man coming to him from uh, a nearby church he had visited and asking him if he, if he believed in God or in Jesus Christ. And he said, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It just doesn't all make sense to me. I haven't put it all together. Uh, this man was an engineer. Um, and he, um, so he had some, some of this mental intellectual roadblock to that. And the man speaking to him said, well, if you were God and you had created human beings, would you want to talk with them? Would you want to have some way to communicate with them? And he said, yeah, that makes sense. I suppose I would. And he said, and what would be the best way to do that? If you were very separate from them because you're a spirit being and they're a people, would it not make sense that you would write to them that they could have some understanding of who you are? And really, that simple message and the, and the Holy Spirit began to go to his core. And he started saying, that is plausible. That is actually, it makes sense to me that God may have used his word to communicate his will and his intentions to mankind. So I thought that was an interesting anecdote. Yeah. some comparisons yeah 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 it's interesting you know how god does use we'll call it anthropomorphic but he uses language where he expresses himself as if he has human characteristics that he doesn't have. He doesn't have a tongue, doesn't have hands, legs, he's spirit being. He doesn't have these physical things, except we talk about in the person of Jesus Christ, of course, who was incarnate in human form. But God himself, the Father, um, will speak in this language in the Old Testament. It's, he's lowering himself for our understanding. He's putting himself in language that we can begin to grasp. And yet, there is such a separateness that those things are very precious to us. They help us to have some concept. I appreciate you saying that, Wade. So let's take this first one. Uh, God is infinite. Would somebody read Colossians 1.17? Yeah. Uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Mm -hmm. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that more in a second. And the second verse I've got here for us to consider is Psalm 147, 5. Somebody read that out loud. Excellent. Thank you. So the concept which, you know, that we'll discuss, and it doesn't fully do justice to this idea of how God's revealed himself, but the fact that God is self-existent, what does that mean to you? What is that phrase, self-existent? How would you put it in your own words? Okay, independent on his own, completely not dependent on anything else is excellent way to part of that. Wade. And therefore no origin or beginning or Yes. So if he's not dependent on anything else, also his as as far as time goes, he's the ultimate uncaused cause. He is timeless. Anything else? Let me uh, read on in these notes a little bit more. 
He was created by nothing, has existed, always existed, forever, is perhaps one of the hardest attributes of God for a believer to understand. In our limitedness, grasping the nature of our limited, limitless God is like holding water as it rages down a river. Indeed, Tozer writes about the confusing, head-spinning attribute of God's infinity. To admit that there is one who lies beyond us, who exists outside of our categories, who will not be dismissed with a name, who will not appear before the bar of our reason, nor submit to our conscious inquiries, this requires a great deal of humility, more than most of us possess. So we face by thinking God down to our level, or at least down to where we can manage him. In his article on Christianity, in, on Christianity.com, Dr. Adrian Rogers writes about the self-existence of God. The name Jehovah is used some 6,800 times in the Bible, is the personal covenant name of Israel's God. In the King James Version of the Bible, it's translated Lord God. Not only does it speak of God's strength, but it also speaks of the sovereignty of God and all the goodness of God. The root of this name means self-existing or one who never came into being, one who always will be. When Moses asked God, who shall I tell Pharaoh has sent me? God says, I am that I am. Jehovah or Yahweh is the most intensely sacred name to which scribes and many will not even pronounce the name. When possible, they use another name. Okay, so the infinite nature of God. Yahweh is a Hebrew name. doesn't have vowels in it. It has consonants in, in the Hebrew alphabet. Vowel markings were dots and above and below letters. But when they translated from Hebrew into Latin, they translated the word Yahweh into Jehovah, which is adding some vowels in it and taking the Y and making it a J. Uh, so and a W to a V. So Jehovah and Yahweh are essentially the same. Um, but why would it be important to know about the infinite nature of God? What would be important for that? For you or for sharing with somebody the true nature of the gospel? Okay. So for each of us to know all we can about him because of our love for him. Good. Yeah. Also, from the aspect intellectually to have respect for our Creator, you need to understand He is capable of doing something, speaking things into existence, doing things that are so far beyond us. That requires an infinite God. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to get to this, but in Acts chapter 17, when Paul is talking with the men of Athens, he begins by talking about God who is creative and by whom all things have their life and their being. So being that they were in a Greek culture, he, he wanted to communicate about this God who is above all, above all things. And I think sometimes when we're having conversation with people in a secular society, the idea of a creator who's far and away above all is a concept that needs to be communicated because it's a starting point for understanding so what is our relationship with him you know what what does that mean to should should god go on just being in his own existence and i go on my, be in my own existence and that's just fine or is there something that it calls me to that's greater than that mm-hmm yeah, the other the otherness or otherworldly. Yeah, of God. Good. Any thoughts or questions on that? Yeah. They had incredible reverence for his name, and, and I, I'm, I'm not really familiar with that particular practice. Dennis, are you? I oh, she was talking about when the scribes would write and they'd come to his name, uh, when they'd put the 
symbols down for Yahweh that they would then throw that pen away. I don't know. But, yeah, I couldn't speak to that, but I, I know that, yes, incredible reverence for just his name, for sure. Yeah. Well, there was, there was meticulous care in nature not to profane the name of God in any way. So, yes, that's good. I will say, as far as the Y and the J and all that, you yeah. see that everything with like, Jesus' name and just really Joshua or Yeshua. Yeshua. Uh -huh. But in the Hebrew, it's a different alphabet. So you don't get this, you know, it's not like the Y didn't change to a J or a J didn't change. It, it started out as something that was a part of the alphabet and the whole Hebrew language. Yeah. Yeah. Their their alphabet. Well, in in Greek it's alpha, beta, gamma, delta. In Hebrew it's aleph, bet, gimel, daleth, and it goes on. So they've got letters that are. It's more of a pictorial alphabet. Um, but again, it's the Hebrew of that time is a dead language to us now. It's not spoken in that way. And so some of our translators are making guesses on exactly something, how something would be pronounced or exactly what the writing is on some things. But we see that, you know, he said 2,800 times this, this expression of God. And God begins by giving it to Moses. This is who I am. I am that I am. Uh, the next one to look at is that God is immutable, which is a fancy word for he never changes Malachi 3 6 I the Lord do not change so you the descendants of Jacob are not destroyed it's important for us to recognize this uh, attribute of God and this may be review for all of you in here but the value of going over these truths uh, so that they be something that absorbs into us and they're more natural to come out in conversations, whether it be in evangelism or expressing your faith or something like that. The more we go over these truths, the more we're able to make reference to them smoothly and naturally as we talk with others. God does not change. Who he is never changes. His attributes are the same from before the beginning of time into eternity. His character never changes. He never gets better or worse. His plans do not change. There are some scriptures that some people would point to that seem to say that they do, but I think there's good answers for those. And his, uh, and his promises do not change. This ought to be a source of incredible joy for believers. Sam Storms writes about this good news of God's unchanging nature. What all this means, very simply, is that God is dependable. Our trust in him is therefore a confident trust, for he, we know that he will not indeed and cannot change. His purposes are unfailing. His promise is unassailable. It is because the God who promised us eternal life is immutable that we can rest assured that nothing, not trouble, not hardship, not persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, shall separate us from the love of Christ. And it's because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever that neither angels nor demons nor the present nor the future not even powers, height, depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 35 through 39. If you were to put it in personally, what does that help you to know or how does that cause you to feel? Talk. Yeah, we're um, just uh, uh, brought up in Hebrews yesterday was faithfulness. Mm. So we can trust his promises. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me feel thankful.
If you are trying to please a God who's a shifting target, that's a whole nother issue. But a God who's rock steady in who he is and what he promises and what his plans are, that's something that should bring great security. Although it does open the door to some very deep and difficult questions, but the more you study, there are answers to those questions. Yeah. He's always going to be righteous. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Amen. Um, God is just. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean? He's just. The opposite of human. <laughs> opposite of human. Okay. In in a particular definition, what else would you describe? What could we add to that? He's always going to do what's right, and he's going to see that right is according to him. He's righteous. Mm-hmm. 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 Right. He's going to do what is right. Well, let's read this and see if that helps fill in the color in the picture a little bit. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness without injustice, righteous and upright is he, Deuteronomy 32, 4. What does it mean that God is just? It means that he's simply fair. It means that he always does right and good towards all men. Likewise, although this is hard for many to accept, his sentencing of evil, unrepentant sinners to hell is also right and good. A natural question that arises from all this then, how then can a just God justify the unjust as each of us without Christ? Tozer answers this by reminding us that we find the answer through the Christian doctrine of justification and redemption, which we'll we'll get into further. Uh, Justification and redemption we'll give more in-depth definitions for, but Essentially, we're saying this through the work of Christ in atonement, which is a word that means uh, making a payment that is satisfactory. It, uh, I'm not giving you a good definition of it right now, but let, let's bypass it for now. Through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated, but satisfied when God spares a sinner. His mercy does not forbid him to exercise his justice, nor does justice forbid him to exercise mercy. He is both fully merciful and fully just. Because because of his sacrifice, the wrath of God is satisfied. Another word you could add in there is propitiation. Satisfaction of the wrath of God. In the case of atonement, it's through a substitute sacrifice, being Jesus Christ. So, if you're in a courtroom setting and the court and the judge says you're found guilty and you've got a $10,000 fine, you're going to pay it or go to jail. And somebody else steps forward and says, I'll pay the $10,000 fine. Then the court is satisfied. Somebody else has paid on your behalf and you don't have to pay that penalty. And the person who paid on your behalf is showing you mercy and you are not in violation of the justice of the court. That kind of set it all, all in, a, in a scene that helps us make sense. So last line here, in the light of God's other attribute, uh, attributes, goodness, mercy, and love, and grace, there are some who might in error say that God is too kind to punish the ungodly. But to believe this means that we dull the reality of his infinite, unchanging justice. God will have justice for sin, either from Christ's atoning death for those who will not accept, uh, 
or for those who will not accept it, eternal wrath and hell. So the, the sin, all sin is paid for. Either paid for by the individual or paid for by Christ. If you're found in Christ, he takes your punishment for you, which is reviewed to us, I know. But um, that highlights the beautiful, glorious justice of God that all sin is paid for. Yes? Right. And I think it's another good thing for us to point out that we have a sense of that inside of us in that when we see somebody wrong or a loved one of ours wrong, we want the person who did the wrong to be punished. We want that justice. We're just not so quick to see it when we do wrong. Mm -hmm. When we do wrong, we're not quick to say, God, you're going to have to bring justice down on me uh, for this, which and as we understand our sinful nature, we'll realize is a daily occurrence. And so we have heaped up guilt upon ourselves through our own volition of sin. Um, so this idea of, of a just God, people really do want a just God. Yeah, wait. Proper understanding of a just or righteous God is also part of the reason we strive for sanctification as the instructions of God's word. If we don't have Yeah, we would be ignoring all the scriptures that said, be holy as I am holy, or if you truly believe, um, you will obey. If you're real, truly my disciples, John 8, 31 and 32, you'll obey my commands, and then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Or um, as we see in, I'm blanking on the address right now, but everyone who has this hope purifies himself we're looking forward to the day of Christ's return and our inheritance that we'll get at that time this might be in first Peter but everyone who has this hope then purifies himself first John there we go thank you Well, and that's, that's the objection that many people wage in Scripture and in, in our modern day is they say, hey, wait a minute, I see injustice happening all the time. Well, what we understand is that the final justice hasn't fallen yet. It will. And that God has, the, in his perfect, perfection of his knowledge and wisdom, he will make the just outcome happen. So um, that all comes into play. He's the only one qualified. To be judged. What was that passage again? First John three three. I can read it. Okay. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Hmm. So it's in being in relationship with God and seeing His righteousness gives us that 
that same desire to have ourselves become like him. Not, as some would say, a cheap grace where, oh good, my forgiveness is secured, now I can go on and enjoy all the uh, sin that I would want to. That's not, that's not evidence of truly getting it. R.C. Sproul says, let's assume that men are guilty of sin in the sight of God. From the mass of humanity, God sovereignly decides to give mercy to some of them. What do the rest get? The rest get justice. The saved get mercy. The unsaved get ju justice. Nobody gets injustice. So they're not in, confl in conflict with each other. Does that make sense? Okay. God is merciful. He is infinitely, unchangeably compassionate and kind. Romans 9, 15 and 16, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have, compa I have compassion. So then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. As noted above, God's mercy is inseparable from his justice. He is infinitely unchangeable, unfailing, merciful, unfailingly merciful, forgiving, lovingly kind towards us. He is inexhaustibly active, actively compassionate. His mercy is also undeserved by us. So Spurgeon writes, it is undeserved mercy, as indeed all true mercy must be, for deserved mercy is not only a misnomer for just is only a misnomer for justice. There was no right on the sinner's part to have saving mercy of the most high God. Had the rebel been doomed at once to eternal fire, he would have justly merited the doom. If the if delivered from wrath, sovereign love alone has found a cause, for there was none in the sinner himself. Another important characteristic of God uh, for us to understand, grapple with, in order to share a saving message with somebody else, in order to know the gospel, and then to be able to articulate the gospel. He's a merciful God. It's, tied, it's going to be tied to our faith that God gives us, that we would um, receive that mercy. Not everyone gets a pardon through Christ it's not a it's not spoken of as if everyone will receive this mercy but those who are who put their faith in Christ let me jump down you can come back and read the rest of that section let me jump down to God is gracious God is infinitely inclined to spare the guilty the Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger great and loving kindness Psalm 145 8 if mercy is not getting what we do deserve, damnation, grace is getting what we don't deserve, eternal life. As mercy is God's goodness confronting human misery and guilt, Tozer writes, so grace is his goodness directed towards human debt and demerit. It is by his grace that God imputes merit where none previously existed and declares no debt where one had been before. Grace is, by nature, it's a free gift. It is the initiative of the giver and no merit on the receiver. No, nothing they've done to deserve grace. So it's an important one for us to be able to communicate. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. His grace is also sovereign. In Exodus 33, 19, I will be gracious to whom... I will be gracious. His choice of showing that graciousness to those that he wills. Any questions on that? Yeah. You've been talking totally on the spiritual realm, mm -hmm. the intellectual realm. It, it reminds me, in the end of chapter 5, when you go to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that we are to be like our Father in heaven, and he gives the example So that you may be sons of your 
Yeah, and it follows under the example, many would call that common grace, that they're, the example he uses is the type of grace that goes out to all humanity. And then the specific grace that we have to do, has to do with salvation, is what we see given through Jesus Christ. So that's a good distinction to make. There's a common grace, and then there's a specific grace that is connected to saving faith and, uh, and given to us. But that common grace can be used as an illustration to the unsaved. As, right? Yeah, an appeal to them, yeah. perhaps. Mm-hmm. Good. Um, God is loving, infinite, unchangingly. He loves us. Um, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Second paragraph says, love, the word staggers before its task of even describing the reality, writes R.C. Sproul in his book, God's Love. As with all attributes, we can only begin to comprehend God's love in light of his attributes. The love of God is eternal, sovereign, unchanging, infinite. The strange and beautiful eccentricity of the free God, Tozer writes, that he has allowed his heart to be emotionally identified with men, self-sufficient as he is, he wants our love and will not be satisfied until he gets it. Free as he is, he has let his heart be bound to us forever. God lo God's love is active, drawing us to himself. His love is personal. He doesn't love humanity in some vague sense. He loves humans. He loves you and me. And I would say that there's that Tozer's not drawing a specific line here that theologically and doctrinally I would draw in that there's a special kind of love God has for his elect that's not the same as the general kind of love that goes for the rest of humanity. So everybody gets an amount of, of love that's common, but there's a specific electing type of love that God has for his children, for those that he is calling back to himself. And that's to be noted as well. Any question on that or comment? It brings us to the next attribute, which is really important for us to get, and that is God's holiness. Holiness, I always thought when I was growing up that holiness had to do with sinlessness, which it does, but the word itself means separate. It means separate. So there's more of a complete otherness of God. Revelation 4.8, as in many Old Testament passages as well, Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. It means sacred, set apart, revered, divine, yet none of those words are adequate to describe the awesome holiness of our God. John MacArthur writes this about God's holiness. Of all the attributes of God, holiness is the one that most uniquely describes him and in reality is a summation of all his other attributes. The word holiness refers to his separateness, his otherness, the fact that he is unlike any other being. It indicates his complete and infinite perfection. Holiness is the attribute of God that binds all the others together. The God is holy means he is endlessly always perfect. And his standard for us is perfection as well. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, Jesus says in Matthew 5.48. That's why we need Christ. Without Christ taking the place for us and dying for our sins, we would all fall short of God's holy standard. So I'm going to leave the rest of that uh, for you to be able to read and review. I just want to have us move quickly. God is good. I think when we're communicating all of these things to somebody, knowing that his goodness is absolutely infallibly it's not a secondary attribute it's it's up there with every part of who he is that he is a good god i love psalm 34 8 because it invites us to not just know in our mind that he is good but to experience it oh taste and see that the lord is good if if you've never and i've used this illustration before but if you've never had an orange and somebody is describing it to you, 
and they describe the color and the texture and then peel and then take one of the wedges out and they taste it. They can describe it to you and they could be as poetic as anything, but you're not going to know until you taste it yourself. And so there's this incredible invitation for us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, and the more we get to experience that, uh, the more we find that it's confirmed. It's true. What I was told about him is actually true in his goodness. And when I taste of his salvation, when I taste of his grace and his mercy in my life, I find that it is good. When I go through trials, he is good. He gives me grace to endure. He gives me uh, insight. Um, he gives me patience when I become, a, a, again, fall into selfishness or get frustrated with other human beings that um, aren't, haven't got it figured out as much as I do in my mind. Uh, he gives me patience. And he gives me uh, gentleness and loving kindness towards others. So God's goodness, not only does it bless us, but it transforms us. Um, I'll let you read on to the, through that. The, the last uh, big point here I want to make is that he's a relational God. And I've got three points on that. He's a relational God. One of them is that he invites us to be in prayer to him. And somehow in the, in the sovereign planning and the ordaining of all of his plans, he has included us to have prayer with him. Now, primarily, prayer aligns our heart with his, trans, transforms us to think like he do, makes, helps us to discover his will. But he also invites us to prayer prayers of supplication, prayers where we ask for, for things, and it makes a difference. I think if I'm praying for the salvation of a person and God answers and gives grace and faith to that person, it's not because I changed his mind, it's because in his sovereign plan, he planned for me to pray and he planned that he was going to answer that prayer. Does that kind of kind of help us our minds put that together? He sovereignly knows and causes things to happen in me so that I will pray for things and ask things according to his will and then he answers according to his will. So he's affected by our prayers. Um, God suffers with us. We see this exemplified in Jesus' life so dramatically that he cares. He, many times it says he has compassion on the crowds. People who are as a sheep without a shepherd, people who are afflicted in various forms, he has compassion. And um, there's a couple specific places where Jesus is stirred in his emotions and he weeps. This is a God who is not simply causing a transaction to happen so that our sins are not counted against us. Or he's not a lifeguard who's pulling us from the ocean, resuscitating us, and then we go on to live our own lives. He saves us to be in relationship with him. He wants us to have relationship with him. Wade? Yeah, maybe you're saying it in a literal way. He's saving us for his glory. Mm -hmm. And that glory includes reproducing in us the same character traits that we're looking at that apply to him. Mm -hmm. In our next section here, I'll get to the glory aspect of it. What I want to point out, though, is that um, he's a relational God and that you, you can know him personally and he can know you personally. The third aspect of that is that he can be imitated. He asks us to be like him. He asks us to live in obedience to him. So there are many aspects of him. And we, as we talk about attributes, um, some theologians would put this in a couple categories, especially Reformed theologians, and call them uh, communicable and incommunicable, which means that there's attributes that we can have a, a form of them in, in our own life as a human, and there's incommunicable attributes which only God has. And so you can kind of see the categories of some of these things. Well, that's a, that's a God category. His omniscience is not a communicable attribute. His uh, omnipotence, his omnipresence, his knowing all things, his power being everywhere at once, his being all-powerful, those are not things that we get. 
But some of his grace, his compassion, his holiness, these are things that we're to be moving towards. The conclusion, uh, I listed three things that point to his relational. Would you add anything else to those? His, his compassion for us, his answer of prayer. Well, it's kind of like compassion. Uh -huh. It's part of compassion. That is the nature of shepherding. And uh, he called David a man after his own heart. Yeah, yeah. And I really believe that is because David had a shepherd heart. Yeah. That was towards the sheep, but towards the people of Israel. Mm. Absolutely. We can't even read Psalm 23 without thinking of the relational aspect that one has with his great shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. You know, this, as you go on reading Psalm 23, you see that relational aspect of it. So that's uh, along with many other examples. Okay, his standard for us, and we're going to wrap up. His standards for us are perfection which is a very high standard. <laughs> Be ye therefore perfect as your heavenly Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. That you may be perfect and complete in all of the will of God, Colossians 4, 12. Christ's exposition of the law, as we see in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew, starting in Matthew chapter 5, penetrates the heart. He says many things like, you have heard it said, but I say... And he raises the bar, basically. He goes directly to the heart, demanding of us the impossible. God's absolute perfection. Thankfully, we stand before him on Jesus' righteousness alone. But let us always aim to imitate our Lord. So his standard of perfection and his standard that he, as creator, has an absolute claim on us. So here's where we get to Acts 17 and also Acts 14. Paul starts with the doctrine of God's creatorship and man's creaturehood. God made the world. He himself gives to all mankind life, breath, and everything. He made every nation of mankind that we should seek him, that we should seek God. The gospel begins by teaching us that we, as creatures, are absolutely dependent on God and that he, as creator, has an absolute claim on us. Only when we have learned this can we see what sin is. And only when we can see what sin is can we understand the good news of salvation from sin. And, or as Dennis pointed out, from the wrath of God. We must know what it means to call God our creator before we can grasp what it means to speak of him as redeemer. Isn't that good? We know what it means to call him creator before we are able to understand what it means to call him redeemer. The last section we're not going to have a lot of time for here is that it tells us the purpose of man according to the Bible. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that God created man and created him for his own glory to Wade's point. Therefore, the ultimate purpose of man according to the Bible is to simply glorify God. The harder question, perhaps, is what does it look like to glorify God? Psalm 100, verses 2 and 3, we're told to worship God with gladness, to know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, so we are his. We are the people, are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Part of what it looks like to glorify God is to acknowledge God, who is our creator, for starters, and to praise and worship him, as we fulfill our purpose of glorifying God, we also, by living our lives in relationship and faithful service to him, 1 Samuel 12, 24 and John 17, 4, since God created man in his image, man's purpose cannot be fulfilled apart from him. King Solomon tried living for his own pleasure, and yet up to the end of his life, he concluded the only worthwhile thing in life is to honor and obey God. In our fallen state, sin separates us 
from God makes it impossible to glorify Him in our own, on our own. But through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, our relationship with God is reconciled. Our sin is forgiven. No longer creates us, it creates a barrier between God and us. The more we get to know our Creator, the more we love Him, the better we understand who we are and what our purpose is. We're created to bring glory Bring him glory. God has unique plans and purposes for each person, but we can know that whatever those plans look like, they ultimately will result in his glory. Questions or comments? Uh, Rachel Garner. In reverence and honor to his holy name. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Kelly, do you want to say really put a lot of things in perspective of who God really is? Yeah. Many times we really can't fathom of what God is and what, what really he's done for us. Yeah. Well, we're kind of um, imprisoned from a human perspective until our, God's word kind of sets us free. And from a human perspective, life is all about me. <laughs> I mean, uh, as one author said one time, I, it must be all about me. I'm in every scene <laughs> when in actuality it's all about him. And we all as creatures, as his creation, are about his glory. And anything that exalts his glory is good for us, especially his, those who know him, those who have been shown his mercy and his grace. It's good for us to have him be glorified and exalted. And it's a process for us to start to live that way. Other thoughts? Yeah, wait. Uh, Jesus taught us that those that would be in fellowship with him in heaven must have been about doing the Father's will. Mm -hmm. That's a great testament. Maybe not the point you were getting at, but the, that verse is a great testament that his will is good and perfect, um, which plays into all of this. But for us to, yeah, for us to acknowledge that and to have our all of our life oriented to that, so good. So, so God has people around this earth who have been redeemed. And they are walking around this world, this world, spreading the gospel and pointing to the creator. And like John the Baptist, see, here's the Lamb of God. Here's the holiness of God. We're sinful people. Uh, and just that we would testify of that and live that way. It may feel like at various times, whether we are a minute segment of humanity or we're banding together, there's more of us. Uh, but it doesn't matter how it feels. This is his plan. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It would be impossible. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, it wouldn't be impossible for us to understand these things or uh, to be transformed so that we would live by them, right? Good. Yeah. In, in understanding all that, you know, we have a saying that, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that's who we are as people, right? And we see the wrongness of that. But in God, we as Christians know from Scripture, but we tend to kind of just take it for granted almost that God is good. And it's such an important aspect of this whole gospel being good news that the sovereign of the universe, who is truly all-powerful, is 
Yeah. Right? You can be an evil guy. Mm -hmm. But he's not. He's a good guy. Mm -hmm. There's more and more people um, who that's their roadblock. They question his goodness. They may accept his existence, but they can't make heads or tails of the suffering they see around them and they question his goodness. So giving a fuller picture of what he's doing, what he has done, what he will do, and of his nature can... I mean, with the help of the Holy Spirit and, and God's word can really be what God uses to open the heart of somebody who has hardened it against him. You, you think of Pharaoh and how hardened he was against God. No matter how much his power was displayed before him, God was confirming or causing greater hardness, but Pharaoh was not going to see God as a good, benevolent, merciful, gracious God. He was just not going to do it. So we pray, we pray for people and ask that we would be instruments of relaying that good news. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in these things as we study them, help them to penetrate, to soak in to our minds and our hearts in ways that cause us to just rejoice in who you are and the message that you give us to bring. And may we study it so that our minds worship you when we are told that we would love you with all our heart soul mind and strength that our minds would be engaged to display uh, a, a greater love for you thank you for our time together today and we pray these things in jesus name amen amen, amen. thank you everyone